says actually. It says we are going live and that this hangout on air is live. April 20th, 2015. It's uh, 8.43 a.m. Las Vegas, 5.43 Nisna, and uh, 10.43 Minneapolis, St. Paul. So we're across in the Atlantic, folks. This is great. Uh, I'm Ron Motter, host of Planeta.com, now in its 20th year online, the World Wide Web and with good friends uh, in South Africa and the U.S., and we're chatting all about responsible travel and wildlife conservation. So, greetings, everyone. Um, can you tell us the big news, Greg and, and Martin? Uh, can you tell us what happened in Cape Town last week? Um, we went out for coffee. That was about <laughs> exciting. <laughs> <laughs> the, I think the bottom line is that, that Martin, as he said earlier, he said that um, you know the the whole responsible tourism um, discussion needs needs another gear and it needs another relook, um, and that seems to be echoed by a number of people. Well, it, just to to answer a little bit more fully. Uh, Deborah, we attended World Travel Market Africa together, and it's uh, um, one of the international trade shows that they have in Cape Town. We live about 500 kilometers to the east of Cape Town. Um, we both live in the same town. We work together occasionally. And I also attended, the, oh my, you, you were there for a short while as well, the, the Responsible Tourism in Destinations Conference. Uh, which was organized by the city of Cape Town and uh, the WTM Africa people and a couple of others. Um, the conference went on for two days and it culminated in the uh, Africa Responsible Tourism Awards, which I have to admit I completely forgot to attend the ceremony and I feel very guilty about that. But um, some of our uh, you know, good friends won awards. And um, the... What, what what Greg is, is referring to is uh, I'm just I came away quite depressed because we don't seem to have progressed anywhere since the Responsible Tourism and Destinations Conference that Ron attended in South Africa five years ago. I think we were talking about the same things. We haven't moved forward. Greg, you're going. And um, yeah, I think. I think that Ron, you over the last three weeks that we've that I've certainly been on on this hangout, um, we've echoed and and expressed our thoughts on the subject, um, and and we've basically um, we've been challenging <laughs> we've been challenging. Um, We've been challenging concepts within mm. responsible travel and conservation, um, specifically conservation tourism. And um, I'm not hearing and I'm not witnessing, even at WTM, I'm not seeing a standard of discussion and uh, language that comprehends the, 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 what we should be dealing with. Um, again, and I feel probably in, in South Africa, it could be the case, but 80% of people in tourism in South Africa haven't actually uh, attended the course that they don't teach. Now, uh, that goes back to the last discussion that Martin and I had where we are basically saying we need to, we need to create a, a, an academy that teaches what we're moaning about. Otherwise, it's never going to happen. Does that make sense? It makes sense. Yeah, the shorthand for that, Deborah and viewers, uh, Martin and Greg have been talking about uh, uh, the school of tourism and basically all the things they don't teach you. Yeah, and do you have uh, some uh, school or uh, organization that you're, you're thinking of uh, having this? Kind of offer or this kind of program? Do you have something in mind already established? Yes, yeah. Martin and I have been planning it for some time now. Mm. And where would it be? 
it will be in nice no? it's experiential and an experiential um, academic space and um, yeah we, we've been talking about it for some time and ba basically putting the the, the, the basic uh, gears and and uh, broad concepts together um, and we'll be able to update this 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 platform as we as we develop. Can both of you talk? Sorry, Deb. Go ahead. Oh, I was just saying, fantastic. We're going to be able to learn a lot from this that that can apply here in the U.S. We're just only having the first discussions, inviting different groups to have these discussions with us in May here, and. The USA is way behind South Africa just in concept of responsible tourism. So we're, I'm going to look forward to learning from, from you and just hearing about your um, being able to create responsible tourism policy in South Africa, but then how does that really get applied in your um, I guess frustration with how that is really in the real world and then coming up with um, identifying the need for education and how does that how do you do that education is really important to us here and <clears throat> so I'm really excited to to be in these discussions especially at this point right now with you and just we're really excited to hear what you're doing and, and what you've learned. Your your lessons learned are really applicable here right now. Ron, what Deborah is asking, if I may, leads me into exactly what I was saying in the green room before we started. Deborah, I'm very proud to be a uh, member of a nation that is the only country in the world that has responsible travel in its um, uh, in its national in this national legislation. Yeah. However, I came away from this last week quite depressed because we have really, really got good, great strategies and wonderful policies in place. I had a meeting, though, with the uh, provincial destination um, investment um, body that that provides information and and and. Um, uh, promotes investment and tourism in our province, which is the province, the, the largest city in the province is the, is the city of Cape Town. I had a discussion with the head of their film unit, and she filled me in on uh, film as it is uh, played in South Africa, how it's done, the uh, national and international, I mean the international treaties that we have with countries like Japan, uh, uh, Germany, um, and how these treaties provide benefits to filmmakers in both countries and all that. Normal stuff. What she didn't realize that she was telling me was she was also telling me about the amazing depth of um, development that's being done, human resources development that's being done. In South Africa, we have an enormous equality problem, as you're probably aware, and an education problem, um, which is uh, just sort of seemed to have got worse and worse since 1994. Our transition to democracy, rather than better and better. But the tour the film industry has taken the idea of transformation and of development on board. They are doing an incredible job of of mentoring, upskilling, training, and providing opportunities for people who uh, have almost no other chance in life, but, but become these fantastically talented um, and, 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 and gifted and technically uh, um, competent, more than competent, people in the film industry. The reason I got so depressed is because I believe that tourism does nothing more than pay lip service to all that sort of stuff. We are touted as being one of the most important uh, um, uh, sectors in the country because we uh, produce 8% of the uh, national GDP, um, hundreds of thousands of people are employed, 
But the thing is that those hundreds of thousands of people, most of them don't even get any f further than being a waiter. Right. And it's very, very depressing. And the problem is not government. The problem is the sector. I've, my, 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 uh, my opinion is the problem is the sector, not the government. Greg, would you agree? Yeah, well, Martin, just to, to feed into that, because it, it amazed me that Deborah said um, that they are behind. And if you, you've highlighted that we've got legislation that is progressive, but to live the, the, the legislation, we, we're lagging in that domain. And um, I think it goes back to what you and I have been saying all along. We need the relevant courses to teach people um, the detail that, that they are, are not being taught. Now, we always come back to this. Um, as you witnessed me having a conversation with one gentleman from the local economic development section, where I said to him, um, if he, he said that they would possibly not put any more money into tourism from a government perspective. And I said to him in that particular area, uh, the, the, the relevant area that he was talking about, you haven't been putting money in, so you will never know what it's like. You know, if you don't know what you're not doing, how will you know what difference it will make if you don't put anything in that you weren't putting in in the first place? Um, I, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, so, after three weeks so, of talking to you, yes. He he had illusions <laughs> about the fact he had illusions about the fact that they were being effective. And I, I told him, I said, You haven't been doing anything. Um, today I spent all of three to four hours giving examples to specific officials um, around where they are not doing anything. And I highlighted specific assets that are government owned that haven't been touched for 20 years and um, and the opportunity, no one will know what opportunity is being lost if they cannot see the opportunity that can be gained from responsible tourism being geared up and leveraged off the asset I'm talking about or the assets. So, you know, it's an interesting for me, Deborah, to hear what you said, but um, for us to get to the next space, I believe we, we in South Africa have to take certain case studies and utilize those case studies in an, in an open classroom dynamic that can teach other tourism um, people how, how you can leverage those opportunities. Can you give me a couple of examples you said today you have been giving uh, examples for three or four hours meeting with people about how uh, responsible tourism policies and activity are, are not being used. Um, can you give me share some of those examples? I would I would like to hear those how, how you were describing those. Well, um, and I'd like Martin to to act as devil's advocate here, but if we look at the, the reference and what is being touted, and bear in mind, Martin and I have always said there are certain good projects. I think that we've got very, very high standard, standards and we're wanting the benchmark to trickle down and filter into places where it should be. So let's take um, a few examples, Martin. You can chuck in when you want there because there's, there's there are projects that are conservation orientated, there are projects that are human sort of social orientated, and then there, there are general opportunities because the word responsible tourism in South Africa feeds into our um, affirmative action policy as well. Would you agree on that, Martin? Yes. Yeah, it's, but, um, but um, it's very important. Uh, not, not just feeds in, but it's a very important part of our yeah. So we've got to, we've got to create opportunities for historically disadvantaged people. Um, what I'm seeing a lot of I'm seeing a lot of greenwashing, where you've got projects that already have got money that have got big investors, um, 
and those big investors, you, you can't go wrong. It's easy to be good when, when, when you've got money and when you've got everything going for you. But to create something from nothing requires an entrepreneurial skill. It requires collaboration at all different levels. Now, Deborah, I know you asked for an example. And I'm, I'm basically trying to win some time to think here because if I give the examples <laughs> that that I'm dealing with, I could get a lot of into a lot of trouble because yeah, okay. I don't I don't want to compromise. But let's yeah. take let's use a very a, a project that I was involved in between 1995 and 1999. Mm. Uh, and in 2000, that project won a Tourism for Tomorrow award. It won two Green Trust Awards and it won a Raptor Award. Um, and that was the what we call the whale route. And it involved whale tourism. Now, before we introduced the concept of a whale route, our legislation basically restricted boat-based whale watching. You, you were not allowed to advertise um, to take people out to watch whales on a boat. And we were one of the, through, through an education program, we created a committee that had scientists and researchers on board. It had tourism structures, regional structures and provincial structures, and it had people from the private sector. And the, the exercise began, first of all, with an education program saying, did you know that whale tourism generates, and this was in 1994-95, whale watching generated at the time 504 million US dollars, of which 0.5% of that was shared by Asia and Africa together. We embarked on this education program teaching each town that, that was on a coastline and that had hard points to view and had decent ports to go out and, and watch whales by boat. We, we began discussions telling them about the opportunity that was available to them. We then progressed and lobbied with the marine, um, marine and coastal management. Uh, that would be the equivalent of your fisheries. Um, I don't know what your department's called. I know it's got fisheries in it and fisheries and wildlife. And we lobbied to the point where they changed the legislation, but it was very, very, very tightly controlled. Um, we only issued one permit per area at the time, and those areas were designated. In other words, you, you, your, where you could go with your boat was restricted. We then altered another set of legislation that was within the guiding area, um, writing the modules for what we called a community guide, a local guide, a guide no, that knew the, the, the local knowledge, uh, the local geography, the lo local sea conditions, and we set about set, uh, uh, de defining a code of conduct for boat-based whale watching operators, and then we trained them. So we set, uh, we literally created the industry from scratch, from nothing. Mm -hmm. And within the first four years, by 1998, I4's research showed and highlighted the fact that we had become one of the fifth fastest growing whale watching destinations in the world. Now. If you go and measure the growth when at the, this world travel market, it was amazing to go and see people that were now running very, very successful operations, but in 1995, we're sitting there wide-eyed looking at this, and this opportunity saying, oh, this is, this is great. Now, to me, that's a good example of, of responsible... Um, tourism response products that that take that educate they create an educational basis they uh, communicate a conservation method message and their footprint is very light and it's very non-invasive and if we compare that to um, and if you look at the economic benefit to the area it's massive um, and Again, it's still very, very well balanced. You don't have, like in many places in the U.S., you don't have boats with a hundred people, you know, hanging over the edges and seven boats around a whale because we still can only have one boat per area. So it, the, the footprint and the invasive, um, and the invasion on the actual species is restricted. Very, very strict rules. 
So then if you compare that to the concept of walking with lions, which we have discussed in the past, and these lion petting, there's absolutely no zero, 100% zero um, conservation in walking with lions um, and the whole lion petting business. So there's just two contrasting exercises, and I can't understand why we're still grappling with those basic things in conservation. Why, when the world sees South Africa as a, a wild place and, and where its natural heritage is benefited or is appreciated, why we are still putting uh, or promoting um, and getting away with things like the lion petting and, and, and other animal petting uh, places where, which literally are just, I mean, I'm, I, I can't express that. Now, I've used two examples there. The third example is going to be a very broad example. Many of our municipalities have got assets that are not being utilized and where they are, they've got massive potential. And if one has to look at what the film industry, as Martin has described, they've been very, very progressive and very aggressive, aggressive and progressive, in the way they have taken their industry forward in, in a responsible manner. And we, we are lagging hugely, but we're lagging because of the lack or the inability to convert those opportunities into responsible uh, tourism examples. Tourism is a, uh, a sector that sticks with what it knows. We, we're still seeing the, old, uh, the same old uh, um, itineraries being sold simply because the big operators are too lazy to look for new ones. Um, tourism is a sector that's very, very comfortable with itself, and it should not be. Tourism is also a sector that thinks it's a special needs child. Look after us particularly well, because we look after your international visitors. But the thing is that international visitors aren't forced to come here. They come here by choice. And by producing the kind of products like Coffee Beans Roots, Ron, your friends, they won one of the WTM uh, Responsible Tourism in Africa awards on, on Thursday. Um, producing those genuine experiences of meeting people, meeting the environment on the level that Greg is talking about with the whales. Um, I mean, whale tourism was the only major disruption in tourism in the last 20 years. Now we need to change that. Let me ask you one and the specific problem question. Let me, excuse me, uh, let me ask you one specific question going back to that Cape Town conference. Um, was there any discussion of uh, wildlife travel and conservation. I have to make a terrible a terrible confession here. I missed a good half of the conference because I was so bored that I went and played elsewhere. I went down to the exhibition hall and met friends and met clients and I um, didn't attend all the events. But I have put up a couple of the, um, the conference events that I did attend. I filmed them because they couldn't get together to do the live streaming although they were filming it. And uh, I've given you in the group chat the, uh, the, the links to those things, and I'll place them in what John Green calls the doobly-doo later. Um, and here comes the cat. Oh, very good. Hey there, kitty cat. Um, so I, I don't know, Ron, to, to be honest, but I didn't hear anything while I was there. Greg, Greg um, did you hear anything? That, that... No, um, you know, I didn't really... Um focus on it that much and um, the majority of, of the rhetoric is um, focused I would say on the on the developed products um, and then there are as, as Martin has said there are some gems I think that it's not all doom and gloom it's just that Martin and I are very critical of where we could be there's a massive lag in the action that is, is led by progressive, um, by progressive legislation. But Martin, I think you should cite the one comment that you, you, you said you were encouraged by, the, the, the comment on responsible tourism and, and responsible actions versus 
sustainable tourism and sustainable actions as quoted by one of the ladies. Am I catching you off guard? You are catching me off guard because I don't remember. I know. I, the, the, I, I, the, we, 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 oh, I know. Exactly In other words, was. the journey. The, the one is the journey. Nombulelo Mkefa, who is in charge of responsible tourism at the city of Cape Town, she's one of the speakers whose uh, uh, presentations I filmed, and she's. Uh, I've given you the link there in the group chat. Uh, to, it's on my it's on my YouTube channel, and she gave us a presentation where tourism, the city of Cape Town, is in implementing responsible tourism. Nombulelo said to me because we were having this discussion about. Um, uh, responsible tourism versus uh, uh, sustainable tourism, and I am of the opinion that sustainable tourism is greenwashing. You can't achieve it until we can achieve a sustainable transport model, and we can't achieve a sustainable transport model for a while still. But Nobelella made a very, very clever point. She said to me, no, not 100% right, because sustainable tourism is the destination. Responsible travel is the journey. And I think that was one of the cleverest things that anybody has said to me about tourism and responsible tourism. Sustainable tourism doesn't happen, but it is the destination. You know, if you can dream, uh, if you can dream it and you can get there. So that's what we've got to dream about. We've got to, we've got to hold on to that dream. Um, the, other, the other point that... Um, I that came out of my discussion with her, uh, and I here's my my notes from my from from my official Cape Town International Convention Centre pad. If you only ever read the books you've written yourself, you'll never learn anything. Tourism needs to start looking outwards, else we'll be repeating this talk shop in 2015, as we were doing now, in, and we did in 2010. Um, tourism needs to stop being a special needs child, and that uh, comment from Nombolelo uh, is is a, 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 a beautiful way of looking at how do we stop being a special needs child. We have a dream. Now, how do we implement it? The implementation of that dream is responsible travel. Now, how do we get the big guys to do that and not to greenwash it? The um, uh, the examples of greenwashing are just so prolific. <laughs> Sorry, I'm off my. I'm off my. Uh, you know, my you know, I might focus you both a bit on the wildlife because uh, you know I pulled in Deborah last week, uh, and we talk about everything except for wildlife conservation. Uh, but it is one of these topics <sighs> in the responsible travel sector that seems to be kind of a. A latecomer to the party. Uh, Deborah and I, Deborah just kind of discovered the discussions that happened last year with the TBEX conference in Cancun, of which there was a big controversy of, of whether or not uh, the conference should encourage participants to go to um, uh, a dolphin encounter where the dolphins are in captivity and you get to pet them and pose for photos with them. And the, the tricky thing here is that for the most part, when we talk about responsible travel, we don't talk about wildlife, and we don't talk about uh, the conservation of the flora and the fauna. You know, that seems to be on the outs of responsible travel. So I'm very pleased to to hear you folks address this and and to say that you know we could be doing so much more. Well, if I can just the, come in, the, another, think... sorry, Greg, can I just because I'm I'm burning. <laughs> A, section, a second section of my discussion with Ombolelo, which I've just put on the, on the group chat, is that the problem is that responsible tourism's definition excludes wildlife. Because the definition that pe people are using, if you look at Harold Goodwin's um, uh, keynote address, responsible <coughs> tourism is creating better places for people to live in and better places for people to visit. Those two words for people have to be taken out of the, destination, out of the definition. Once that's done, we can be inclusive of the environment, and that's the, that was the problem with the with the uh, with with the uh, the other problem with the um, conference. That's why we didn't hear anything about wildlife and the environment. Okay, so Ron, Ron, now I'm starting to burn because 
Mar you, up till now, since you've been meeting us, um, Martin and I have always agreed with each other. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw a spanner amongst the, the works okay. here. Is a hunter that comes from the States to South Africa to hunt a species, is he a tourist? Certainly. And is there such thing as responsible hunting? Good question. And I would say, and I would say, and I would put my, I would say yes. Okay. So I I read for the, about the twentieth time a book uh, called A Game Warden's Report, who cites an example in America of a group of hunters, specifically a, a, a club, a specific club that focused on a specific species of duck, and that that duck was being eradicated and threatened to the brink of extinction, a migrating um, species in the States. I, I would need, at the next, at the next uh, hangout, I'll bring you the details of it. But this club, this, this club that had many chapters that spread across your, your coastline, um, basically uh, this club, through education and through a process of um, uh, educating farmers about the habitat that they shouldn't destroy, revived the, the species and got the numbers back up to where they were. And that there is um, a whole concept of, of responsible t tourism or responsible hunting. Uh, and those hunters are tourists. So um, we've got the worst examples of, of the canned lion hunting, which is actually being fed by tourists because the guy who's breeding the lion is effectively selling that lion on to, to being uh, hunted. Whether it's hunted responsibly or not is, is a, a question. On the, on the other side of that scenario, you've got hunters who I know personally hunting in Central Africa, and it's those hunters that are actually stopping the poaching of, of big game like lion, I mean, lion, um, but more so your elephant and your rhino. So I now come back to language and comprehension of the concept of responsible travel and responsible or conservation tourism. <laughs> if we do not peg the language and if we don't get people to comprehend the concepts, we will never get to the space which we, we're striving to achieve in responsible, in, in responsible tourism. All good points. Greg, uh, wait one second, uh, uh, Martin. But you know, all good points. And and the question that I would pose is, why is this not a topic then up for discussion at these responsible tourism events or at any tourism conference? Uh, are we well, so? Lot, and, and again, lot, I think I know the answer. But are we so afraid of of debate and controversy? You know, to me, that would be a wonderful discussion. You know, what are the pros and cons of hunting? Why is that not discussed? Uh, can lion hunting? Why is that still not on the table for these tourism conferences in South Africa? We're just ignoring the topic. I want to disagree with Greg about the fact that I disagree with him because I actually agree with you. Um, <laughs> I just personally can't hunt. I have tried, and I was a spectacular failure at it. And as a result of that, I just don't. But it's, it's not me. about me. I'm not against somebody who hunts in an ethical way, in correct, uh, uh, you know, with, with the principles of, um, of of sustainability. I know I'm going back to that word, but we do know that that um, there is a, such a thing as carrying capacity. Uh, environments have been natural environments have been reduced, and if you have too many antelope on 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 the felt, you're going to have overgrazing just as much as if you have 
too many um, uh, Catalan things. But um, it's the way and it's done. It, it's why it's done. These are important questions. And where I think we can take uh, lessons, although she's not directly um, addressed this question, as far as I know, is from Anna Pollock and her papers and her work on conscious tourism. If you know what you're doing and why you're doing it, and if there's a grand plan that you're working towards, there shouldn't be a problem with ethical hunting. And I put it in uh, parenthesis because not everybody's going to agree with it. But I, I don't, um, I don't say that people mustn't hunt. Um, okay, I think so the way it's done. Uh, and, and uh, sorry, uh, the last point. Ron's question about why aren't we talking about this? I think it's because um, it's it's a it's it's. It's a scary topic, and it goes back to what I was saying earlier. Rather, let's just refresh and rehash the same crap we've been doing for the last ten years, twenty years. Um, it needs it. It needs to be. It needs to be discussed, and by the same token, you know, um, as, as as something like you know, open discussion about sex education or drug education or that sort of thing. If you if you suppress that, you're going to increase the problem, the problems of the uh, of the addict. And if you but suppress Martin, the question, Ron is asking, you're going to I suppress the problem. I want to I want to just add, Ron. You said why are we having the discussions in South Africa? Why aren't we having the discussions in Europe and in the States? Because it's the people from the States and Europe who are who are <coughs> basically. I'm stop smoking, Ron. Uh, and in it's the, the people, it's, very it's much the in people the in the states. It's the people in the states, and it's the people in Europe, who are buying the tickets to number one. Firstly, to go and pet the lion. Number two, to volunteer at a place where they pet lions. Num number three, um, to to basically, and Martin, this is one pretty much that I think I've discussed with you before, to, to go on so-called uh, research projects where, where the people are basically not actually volunteering, but they're actually replacing the, the work opportunities of local people. And, um, you know, there's just three quick examples of, of the, um, just the smoke screen that's put up. But, we must either somehow the conversation must not only um, take place. It's, it's the people coming in that have to be educated. The, who's having that conversation? And I'm amazed at people who constantly, um, from the universities in Europe, that think conservation is about saving animals. I think that first world countries are create are not growing conservationists. They're growing animal rightists that have lost the plot when it comes to what conservation is. There's a double page spread in a really expensive brochure for a conservation experience at a massive uh, 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 nature reserve, private nature reserve, about 300 kilometers east of where we live, in the Eastern Cape. The this is in a, in a, in a youth travel uh, catalogue. The people who should be answering these questions are as much us as the animal planets and the National Geographics. Because I believe that, Greg, those channels are setting the bar in a direction that it shouldn't be set. Not up or down, but where it shouldn't be be at all. They're creating animal lovers rather than people who understand the ethics of conservation and how we as a species should be interacting with our environment. The discussion needs to be taken, as I said earlier with my, with my note here, it needs to be taken outside of tourism. It needs to go beyond tourism because the, the, uh, um, the National Geographics and the animal planets of this world make it seem 
like this youth tourism thing is great, like the, the petting lion thing is great. There is a lot of, um, they need to, they need to uh, examine their um, principles and, and their, their ethics, I think, and they need to engage with people in the countries um, to find out whether what they're doing is ethical. You know, I'd like to make this into a, a segue, a, a nice segue, uh, to the work that uh, Deborah and I are doing right now. In May 2015, we're hosting an online discussion about responsible local travel. You know, it's, it goes back to the language, Greg, and you're right, I don't think we have the proper language. Uh, we don't really talk about responsible travel in the U.S. outside of certain classrooms or certain co conferences, but we do talk about local travel, and we do talk about, um, you know, even the misnomer of travel like a like a local, which uh, Robert Reed uh, just made a wonderful video on YouTube about that Greg was uh, promoting from Transitions Abroad. Um, but Deborah and I have this idea. We don't have our language down just yet. But for Deborah and myself, that's just fine. But we're going to be looking at indigenous tourism, uh, food tourism, uh, wildlife and wilderness and park travel, and using the U.S. as kind of a as a, as the area of focus in the month of May for these discussions. We'll be doing. Uh, Twitter questions on Mondays and Hangouts on Fridays, um, but I I would agree uh, entirely with you, Greg, that this has to be discussed in the U.S. and uh, and I'll ask a very innocent question, but you know where do we, you know, at what events is South Africa and Southern Africa promoted? You know, here in the U.S., uh, you know, again, it's still a world away. We're just not hearing about you know, Africa unless it's a crisis. And, you know, it's not just Africa, it's how we treat Mexico as well, or Asia, or Canada, or Europe. You know, we're, we're terrible. We're terrible looking outside the world. Deborah? You're America, the world. Um, yeah, we, we selected to uh, examine the U.S. And, and our discussions and topics are responsible local travel in the USA. That's the focus. And there, we, we see a opportunity because here we have a lot of things kind of coming up at the grassroots. We have um, the local food um, focus and movement now. In fact, Minnesota is a leader in that, in food co-ops, local food. Um, slow food, as you know. Uh, what we also see a growing sharing economy that is a lot of it is focused on tourism and travel, uh, Airbnb, cars, you know, all kinds of things. Um, we see the buy local independent business, uh, buy local campaigns. That is a national effort now. There are national organizations. Um, working with independent businesses in their states and across the U.S. to promote education about why it's important to buy local, how that money stays in your economy, um, you know, instead of going to shareholders somewhere else. Um, there's a lot of these native and indigenous um, tourism looking at building better cultural guidelines around tourism and travel, and you can look at Hawaii as an example of a state in the U.S. where the Native people have had a tremendous impact, mainly negative from tourism. Um, so what, what Ron and I are looking at is an opportunity to bring those kinds of groups together in the U.S. And not all of them recognize that they're part of the tourism and travel industry. You know, so, sometimes a small shop may not realize. And our goal is to simply discuss what would uh, responsible local travel be in the U.S. and how might our singular messages become stronger when we combine them. You know, the local foods and the local 
um, buy local campaigns certainly have a lot in common um, because they want people to invest and make a community better um, and people have healthier food. Um, so we're taking this opportunity to reach out to those sectors and bring them together and look at um, what people are doing in those sectors and how does that kind of fall under the responsible tourism umbrella. Um, where can we leverage our individual movements together to create a bigger impact um, with educating the public, educating, sharing information between ourselves, and how we can learn from good examples as well, you know, what, what different groups are doing here. Um, but also, to uh, Ron and I have noticed this for so many years, there is a lot of organizations from the United States that are based here that supposedly do ecotourism, sustainable tourism, some kind of uh, travel related development that you know they have this expertise so they are going to other countries to extend and teach about and train and implement these different programs about tourism and travel yet they don't do any work here in the US there's very few of them that actually do substantial work in the United States so in some ways we want to challenge that and uh, understand why the US is behind on even talking about responsible travel in the world uh, it's not a term that's um, common or really understood here much at all. So um, any advice you might have for uh, sort of educating the grassroots um, communities and movements that we are trying to bring together um, since you have done some of this before um, I would I would love to hear more about that. I have a proposal. Please. <laughs> I, I, I think that it all comes down to a balance between altruism and, and then profit. And in South Africa we have incentives, maybe not so much incentives but more pressure. Um, our affirmative action um, legislation basically pushes for responsible travel within the social uh, platform or, sec or, or dynamic. That's why probably as Martin said responsible travel within the conservation arena is not upheld as best as, as possible. But here's my, my proposal. Why don't we try and initiate an example. You take you take a dynamic of, let's say, uh, cultural tourism, bring them out to South Africa where you want to make a difference. We will, we will get them exposed to parallel dynamics. It might be a minority group, it might be a specific culture, it might be whatever the example might be. We'll find the match here and we twin them. It'll be a good example in South Africa and we twin them and and take them through the language and the ability of how and and then let's see see if it works in my day we used to have pen pals and you used to write to your pen pal in the other country and he would write back to you or she would write back to you and you would share your uh, your experiences of being a school child in your countries. We should look at that example and start because we've got the net today. Uh, we can do it face to face today like we couldn't do it in my day. But maybe um, the the idea of a of of of, um, of a delegation or a tour or that sort of thing is awesome. Maybe we can start on a smaller scale. Maybe we can start right here with the Hangouts by uh, 
getting together people like uh, uh, the people at, at Coffee Beans Roots together with keep people who are trying to do community-based tourism at a, in a country uh, in a, in a town somewhere near one of you. Well, and I love that idea. I love that idea for to both of you. And and the the, mm -hmm. the question I have is again, it's uh, it's digital literacy, and how do we bring people up to speed on using Facebook, using a Google Hangout, using Flickr, what whatever your choice is, whatever we can get people to do, because for the most part, you know, again, reflecting on what Deborah was saying. You know, a lot of people they they don't see themselves connected to travel and tourism. You know, we are, um, you know, we're, a, we're we are a small community museum. Well, again, well, who do you depend on visiting, or where do you get your income stream? Well, from visitors, but that's not tourism. That you know, tourism. We don't. We still lack the language in, in, around the world and in this country, in the U.S., of understanding how we fit into that tourism and travel sector. Which is why, you know, it's going to be very important in May. Uh, the second to the tenth is this elongated week called the National Travel and Tourism Week. You know, it's and uh, that was kind of one of the inspirations that helped uh, kick off uh, the idea for Deborah and myself to host kind of an alternative, parallel discussion. Again, a kind of a grassroots up approach of looking at these issues without necessarily defining them, uh, and hopefully bring as many people in as possible. Can that then feed into what you're talking about? I'd say certainly. You know, can we identify some examples of cultural tourism? And I think there would be some really good, you know, people-to-people -people kind of uh, contacts that could be mutually beneficial. Ron, um, I went. I had the privilege of um, going over to Taiwan. The during my time developing the whale route. Um, I was invited to by the, the Taiwan Cetacean Society to go and learn about uh, what they're doing. And then they in turn came to South Africa and I took them to witness what we had set up. And um, it was quite amazing because the, the Taiwanese culture, 97% of their tourism is local. It's just local travel. and. You t the culture is very, very, very different in, in so many senses, especially when it came to uh, viewing wildlife in the ocean. And um, when they came to South Africa, I was able to impart value systems through interact interaction that enabled them to fully comprehend and uh, understand the the dynamic uh, at play and go back uh, re-energized and vitalized just as I was when I went there there were a whole lot of things that they were getting right that we just didn't get right they did it naturally and what was so interesting is the Polynesian side the East Coast was uh, exercising uh, the utilization of marine mammals from in a responsible way whereas the West Coast was actually still uh, using the bycatch and quite open about applying for for um, uh, quotas to 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 take marine mammals, but I come back to that experiencing and and setting up the models, and this is where um, where whenever I go to Europe and I lecture in Europe, I ask the people I'm le lecturing with, I say, are you a conservationist? And they say, yeah, yeah they, they, they are conservationists. And then I, some of the people say, no, I'm an animal rightist. And some of them say, no, I'm an animal welfareist. But I have a, a very, very good test for whether you are a conservationist. And, and it sorts people out very, very quickly. Because when you get to the concept of of the Kruger National Park, and then you, you look at, say, uh, in, I don't know, Martin, there could be a whole lot, lot of other places we could choose, but I'm thinking particularly of, um, Martin, what's the area where Joyce Poole and Katie Payne work with elephants in, um, in Africa? Uh, Kenya. 
um, specifically, what's that park called? The Kenya Park, I'll which is with elephants. Yeah, like, I'll think of yeah. the name. Yeah. It'll come to me. But they had a policy where, in the Kruger Park, in 1990, up to 94, there was a policy of culling to reduce the, the numbers. And in, in um, conservation ethics discussions, I ask, do you agree with culling or not? But specifically elephants um, in specific dynamics. And m the majority of people pretty much always say, no, uh, we, we are, we're against culling. And then I say to them, so you choose one species above many other species. And Ron, this highlights the example of us talking about the 50,000, the small 50,000 as opposed to the big five. Because few people understand how elephants can decimate an area, a, a managed area. Um, if and, and wipe out many, many different species. Similarly, I ask the, and, I, and I highlight the point, when you see on the front page of the newspaper the story of a rhino having been poached, have you any idea how many other species have been taken out on that same day but don't reach the, the, the front page of the newspapers? Because of the fact that they, they are the small 50,000 and not, and not one of the big five. Amboseli, Amboseli Elephant Research that's Project. That's it, Amboseli uh, National Park. Yeah, yeah th that's the problem with the, um, uh, with the, with the, with the cute and furries. They're, they're, they're big and sexy. Um, and they only, um, uh, you know, icons don't, uh, just as Brad Pitt is not, the same as every man on earth, because he's particularly good looking. Um, an icon like an elephant is 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 uh, has the same position in um, uh, um, in 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the environmental hierarchy, but people don't think of the three of us as when they think about a typical male. They think they think about the the uh, the guy who's clever enough to say that, I mean, look at me, I don't have a real job, I go to work in makeup. Um, the, there's a huge problem, and it's, it should be a, a red flag for responsible tourism in marketing icon, like save the elephant, save the rhino. It's not to say that we mustn't save the elephants to save the rhino, but there's a whole ecosystem that supports those those animals, and they support ecosystems in turn. True story. True story. Uh, true story. According to no such thing as a fish. Do you know why World Wildlife Fund chose the panda as its icon, as its logo? Uh, I've heard so this easy before. Easy to draw in black and white. You could. Draw, it's in black and white, so you could uh, on on black and white posters. It comes out fine. Okay. Hey, final comments, and we'll wrap this up, and you know, st stay online, and we'll, and uh, but anything else you'd like to say today? Uh, I'll just give the give the floor to Deborah. Yeah, she's spoken too much today already. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just sharing some links over on the side there, um, and I'd really like to invite you to sit in on the Google Hangouts on Fridays in May. Okay. They're set up where we're going to be fe have th about three featured guests for discussion that will speak um, as much as they can in five minutes about their work and their um, how it relates to responsible travel in the U.S. So we're sh trying to showcase some of the best ones and then link them. And I think if you could join us, it would you can provide a good analysis of what you see that we're doing here, um, what we're doing right, and what our challenges are, and perhaps where we could cooperate further with you. Um, and then there is a, a about a 10-minute survey. If you could take that sometime soon, that. That's helping us kind of figure out some of the questions we want to ask during the Hangouts. Um, 
And I've put that link to both the wiki spaces, um, our wiki that we're developing on Local Travel USA, and also the Google form where the survey is. So if you guys could check those out and listen in, uh, send in your questions or suggestions during the, that time, that would be very valuable to us. And then finally, I've listed a link there to the Rethinking Tourism and Eco Travel book that Ron referred to earlier, um, just in the FYI. Um, but uh, it, it's been really helpful and enjoyable um, meeting both of you and learning more about how um, responsible tourism is or isn't working in South Africa, sharing some of your frustrations with us. And, um, you know, I want to continue this dialogue. I think it's so important that we're sharing. And I want to thank Ron for hosting these and teaching me how to use Google Hangouts. I'm still not really that familiar. But um, it is uh, uh, more accessible than us having to fly and spend that money to meet each other at this point. So I really want to... Um, Say thanks to Ron for organizing this and just a begin beginning of my discussions with you, but I really look forward to this. So thank you very much. Hey Deborah, one uh, one uh, technical request and anyone else watching, uh, if you can copy uh, the text that you put into our group chat and paste it into the event page so that everyone can see it. Otherwise, once this Hangout is over, anything that's in the group chat will disappear. And Martin, I've already taken your uh, video links and I've added it to the event page. I mean, there's no, plenty of reading and viewing. I had, cop I had copied it to a, a, a text document, so you saved me there. As a final point from my side, I think that the uh, one thing that we should possibly take away from this evening's discussion is the importance of looking at the language that we use. I think when we go to uh, when we go to the industry, um, which we shouldn't even call an industry, when we go to the sector and we talk of, talk about environment, that that it, we must start to um, to identify those words that bring the blinds down across people's eyes. Um, that, and that's the kind of word. As soon as they hear environment, oh. <laughs> We need to talk about the landscape, the place where we live. So we need to simplify it so that it is more uh, in your face. I think we, 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 we need to really, as communicators, need to, need to think about that. Thank you. Greg, any final comments? Well, I've said a lot, and I think that... Um, First of all, it's lovely to meet Deborah. Again, I echo her words to say thanks to you for the Hangout. And, and then lastly, just to echo Martin's words, um, until we comprehend and uh, the concepts of responsible tourism and until we can articulate them to the, to, to the people that we're working with, um, I don't think they're going to translate as quickly as we want them to. So it comes down to how do we get the user uh, taking the journey to choose responsible travel. I still maintain that economics is the driver, demand drives. And I still maintain that the more people traveling, the more people traveling ask for responsible product, the more the product will strive to be responsible. Well said, well said. Exactly. Um, yeah, I, I think that those demands um, are shared by these different movements that are here in the U.S. And um, they're demanding better food, fair trade products, you know, things like that. And so we just have to figure out that language and travel as well. Uh, on a final note, uh, before, I want to thank everybody for participating. Uh, this has been a, a, an enjoyable and quotable hangout. Uh, you know, I look upon this kind of as, a, as a, something 
that you know 20 years ago would do, would have just been interviews and conversation, private conversations, and now it can be public and open access and uh, really doing, uh, very good conversations. Last point I'm going to make is this. If you were here in Las Vegas, I would invite you to Discovery Park on Friday for Dogs and Drones. Dogs and Drones is our local meetup Friday afternoon afterward, 5 to 7 p.m. So please bring your dog, bring your drone. If you don't have a dog or drone, that's fine. Come anyway. It's just a pretext for a neighborly meeting. Uh, you know, let's use the words that people are using. And uh, yeah, dogs. You can't take your cat for a walk. Uh, <laughs> We'll have more about you that. You can later. bring the cat to hang out. Mind you, you can bring the dog to hang out too. Yeah, bring, bring your cat. My dog is going to hang out. We love them. We love them. Hey, thank you, everybody. Thank you for watching, everybody uh, watching this. If you can, please, as I say, share share the hangout, share the video, timestamp any notable comments that you'd like us to pay attention to. Uh, for the participants, yeah, please add those links to the Google event page and to and or to the YouTube video. So we'll flesh out those show notes, and uh, we we will continue this conversation. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.